everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the objective today is to talk to you about completing your Fulbright foreign student applications. As you may well know, the deadline is April 17th, 2017, which means that your completed application must be in and submitted at that point. Now, please don't leave your applications till the last minute because what happens is everyone leaves it for the night before and April 17th being a public holiday you're going to jam up the system which means your application may not make it through which means we won't get your application and I know you're a bright candidate and unfortunately you won't get to go to the US next year in August 2018. So today I want to talk to you about completing your application and then we're going to go through the application, different steps of the applications, just to make sure that you are on the right page and that you have all the components of the application. But what is the Fulbright Foreign Student Program? Do you know what you're applying for or have you just seen that application form and filled it out? The Fulbright Foreign Student Program is part of the Fulbright flagship programs and what that means is it's an opportunity that was started way back in 1946 by the US government Senator J William Fulbright and this is an idea of his that he put into action after the Second World War and he believed that people needed to learn about each other's countries and exchanges so that they had a better understanding and hopefully there'd be more love and peace in the world in the world so in 1946 senator j william shared and did the first transfer we don't know what the country is but this program has been running for 71 years and in its time it's produced 53 nobel peace prize winners that means students like you started out as a master's or phd applicant and now ended up being a Nobel Peace Prize winner. It came to South Africa, the Fulbright Foreign Flagship Program rather, came to South Africa in 1953. And uh, since then, South Africa has sent over 2,000 candidates and students, scholars, on various programs to the US for different durations, some to do masters, some to do PhDs, and some on short-term leadership developments. And these people came from all walks of life. They were students, they worked in government, they worked in business, they were in the arts, and so on. So this is a very prestigious scholarship opportunity sponsored by the US government. And each year, the Fulbright Foreign Student Program, which is geared towards students wanting to do a master's and PhD in the US, and possibly students who are registered for a PhD at a South African university and now wants to go over and do a year's research work based on the field of interest that they registered for in at the South African university. And that is a fully funded opportunity. The US government invests approximately $40,000 per student per year to go and take up this wonderful opportunity. So given the limited number, it is a very competitive application and you have to be an exceptional student. It, you have to stand out in all fields of the selection criteria, which by the way is online at our website at za.usembassy.gov. If you go click on education and cultural exchanges and click on section number seven or page number seven, the Fulbright flagship programs, you'll find all the information you need to know about the Fulbright Foreign Program, as well as how to apply and where to apply. But just in case you're stuck and you haven't submitted your application just yet and you need some help with the application, we'll be going through some of the basic components of the application. Now, one of the downfalls of all young people and especially South Africans is that they don't like to read instructions. They like it to be told to them, like I'm telling it to you now, nothing wrong with that. But we strongly urge you to go onto our website, onto the Fulbright flagship program link and read the handout called Specific Instructions for South African Students. That is crucial. 
if you have not read that and you continue to fill out your application, we will know that you have not read it because you will either phone into our office, drop us an email, or submit an application that is incomplete or incorrect. So once again, we urge you to go and read the handout, specific instructions for South African students. If you read that and you have any questions, you may email us and say, I've read the instruction, but I'm still not sure about ABC. Hurry up because you only have one week left. So moving on, we're going to go to what the embark website looks like and that is the site where you fill out it's an international application site for the Fulbright program run throughout the world and right now it's run in 160 countries and we use one application site that is why we have the handout specific instructions for South African students because some components on that website are not applicable to you as a South African so let's go to the Embark website. Okay. This is the Foreign Student Program 2018-2019. Although the application deadline is in February 17th. It's for students to begin studying at a US institution in August 2018. Because you, as you all well know that the US academic year runs very differently to the South African academic year. The US academic year runs from August to May and the South African academic year runs from January to December. So because we are applying to an American college, we have to fit in, we have to consider our graduation dates when we apply for this program. Students who graduate in December 2017 are eligible to apply for a master's or PhD this year. Students who graduate in May 2018 will be eligible to apply for the Fulbright program in 2018. Okay, so today the idea is to... So before I start, I'd like to introduce my colleagues in the background. I'm working with my colleague Margot Moore, who, who is a Fulbright program coordinator, and my colleague Chris Marie, who is our IT guru. So today the idea is to give you an overview of the online application and then to talk about some of the very important components which a lot of students skim over when applying but which is very important to the selection and the interview process. And then any questions we'll take at the end of the program. So this is what the online application look, looks like. Um, the, way, the link, if you cannot see it, if you're listening to this, is hmm? oh. okay. This is the link apply.embark.com backslash student backslash Fulbright backslash international backslash 20 backslash. That is the application site. What you have to do is when you log on to the site, they ask you to come up with a username and a password, just like you do with everything else that you register for, for the rest of your life, which you will keep safe because you will not fill out the application in one go. There's an average of about 14 pages that need text and then the documents that you need to upload. So it's something you don't have to do in one go, but if you're only starting your application today or tomorrow, then I guess you would have to sit down and fill it out in one go. Um, so make sure you keep those details safe. So you've logged in. Now you're at the page where it's called the home page, and it says, Welcome Education USA to the online foreign Fulbright application. To complete the application, follow the steps outlined below. 
Review the instructions as there may be specific information that the Fulbright program in your country is requesting. Ah, uh -huh. like I said earlier, go back to our website, za.usembassy.gov, because that is the handout that they're talking about. If the country is not listed, the Fulbright program is not being offered at this time. Lucky for us, if we go down to number one instructions, it says click here for a list of Fulbright program offices and websites. When you click on that link, it'll take you to um, the country, a, a link that lists all the countries, and of course you'll find South Africa there. It'll take you right back to za.usembassy.gov. Okay, so before we begin with the application form, I just want to run through this box on the left-hand side. This is very explicit. So it's got the instructions, which you will read. I know when you go onto the South African website, or if you follow that link over here, you will be able to get all the instructions you need. There's the application form, which is pretty straightforward and needs to be filled out. And then the number three, there's documents and Oops, there's documents and essays that you need to upload. And these are very, very important documents and essays. Pay serious attention to them because incomplete applications and incorrect applications will not be considered. Number four says supplemental forms. Again, in the instruction, specific instruction handout, handout found on our website, it'll tell you exactly what supplemental forms you do and do not have to upload as a South African. When I get the applications and the applications are reviewed, we will very easily be able to determine who did not read the instructions because they will have some of the documents there that we do not require. Number five is recommendations. That is a very, very important site. Every student who applies, whether you apply for the scholarship, you apply for a job, you will need referees. And in this case, for the Fulbright application, you need to submit three recommendation letters from three different referees. The important point here at number five is because it's an online system, your references need to be submitted online as well. They cannot come through you. You cannot be handed the application, uh, the reference letter, it because it's confidential. So what we suggest is that you click on the recommendations, you get the email address and the name of your recommenders, three of them, and you will fill in the details on number five. You fill out the email and the name of the recommender. The system then, the inbox system, will send the recommender an invitation to send you a recommendation with a preset format. The, your recommender will receive this email, fill out the recommendation, and return it to the inbox system. This will automatically be attached to your application. Very important number five. So now you've completed filling in your application, you've uploaded all your documents, and you've written your personal essay, you've written your study proposal. You click on number six, and that is called the application inspector. And, and that's exactly what it does. It inspects your application to determine whether you have completed all the sections. Now, the application inspector will not be able to determine whether you completed it correctly. The instructions, for South Africa will help you determine whether you have completed your application correctly. When you are comfortable that you have answered every question, you have read and reread your application, you have gotten your supervisors or your professors or your very best friend or somebody you have confidence in and who has the ability to understand what you're going to do, and you got them to read your application and made certain that you cross all your T's and dotted all your I's, you then go to number seven and you say submit application. That application will then move from the in progress box, which is where all of your applications are lying right now, and be transferred to the receive box. When it comes to the receive box, you will no longer be able to make any alterations to your application. It means we have received it, 
And if there are any mistakes and you realize it afterwards, you wake up in the middle of the night in a sweat and realize, oh my gosh, I didn't add my last letter of reference or I didn't complete my essay, well, then I'm afraid it's too late. So what you need to do is inspect your application thoroughly before you submit. Now, there are over 400 applications lying in our in-progress box. Each of you must realize that if you want to submit your application this year, then you need to press this button, Submit. If you plan on applying for next year, but you started your application this year, well, then that's okay. No worries about that. It'll just lie there, and you can continue with your application next year. Okay, so let's move on to the application form. Oops, before we get to that, let's just read some of the instructions. Again, we talked about our website, za.usembassy.gov. Click on education, dash culture, educational exchanges, hyph backslash Fulbright, hyphen fl flagship, hyphen programs. That'll take you to the exact page. But if you're not certain, just press, just click on za.usembassy.gov. What we've done is to add some videos to our website that, number one, talks about the GRE exam, which we will come to, which is a very, very important exam. And uh, we've got some guidelines and some tips. We've got an overview. So click on the web, very short video, click on the web and listen to Professor Van Mertens when he talks about the GRE prep test. Again, we talked about the South African specific instructions. Please read this. If you ever read anything in your life, read the instructions before you apply. Click on the link to apply. That's the Embark and create an account, which we talked about, and you begin your application. Just remember, you've got to save your work frequently because the system will log out after 40 minutes of inactivity. So if you suddenly get a WhatsApp message and you start engaging in a conversation while you're filling out your application, just remember that if you haven't saved your work, you will lose it all and have to restart the process. So save your work, shut down, log out, and then you go to your WhatsApp messages. Any long answers, we would recommend you do them in a Word document and then you cut and paste and you upload into the application again because of the 40 minute logout. So even though you're working on your application, you could very well be logged out after 40 minutes while you're thinking about phrasing your personal statement, for example. This is a very important document and it needs to be given some consideration. Also, when you, when you do it in the Word document, you can use different fonts and formats and make it fancy. Stick to the space provided. When you're filling out your essay and anything else that is a little bit lengthy, just remember that if they give you an allocated space, then you must stick within the lines. Because anything that goes over the allocated space will not come out when it is printed and we will have an incomplete essay or personal or um, study proposal. Again, preview the application before you submit. Very important. Okay, so this, so here we are on the application. This is by your data. It talks about, whoops, it talks about uh, your country of citizenship. Of course, you know where you are. Your country of residence. Do you have any other citizenship? Yes, you tick it off. If not, you would delete. Your study plans. Which application cycle are you applying to? If you are filling out your application right now, then you are applying to the 2018-2019 cycle. And we talked about that because the American academic year starts in August. And August 2018 is when this cycle will start, will commence at a US university. What is your degree objective? Is it a master's, a PhD, or a non-degree? And if you read our website, we will have explained in the instructions, we'll have explained the three categories and what they mean and what the requirements are for those. What is your proposed major field of study? If you're doing psychology, what is your specialization field? Are you doing clinical psychology? Are you doing child psychology? Are you doing neuropsychology? You have to determine. 
And when it says briefly describe the specific area of the field in which you plan to specialize, then you describe it very briefly. Future plans, describe your career plan, what you plan on doing after you complete your studies in the US, what you plan on doing when you come back. And as part of the Fulbright uh, philosophy, that is a very important question because what you plan on doing in the US, it's expected that you come back to South Africa. There's a two year uh, clause written into the contract that all South Africans who go over on a Fulbright contract have to come back for two years and plow back into their communities and into their, their, into their organizations, what they have learned and studied in the US. Okay, so page two, you list all the educational institutions in reverse order. That means the most recent, and you have to include your high school. Include a copy uh, or the name of your high school. You don't have to include the subjects and the grades you received. You also have to list all the scholarships and fellowships and academic prizes and honors that you receive. That is important because that is what separates one student application from the next. If you don't have any, don't fabricate any, right? Publications, if you are now at the PhD level and you've done some publications, this is where you include all of them, which journal and so on. Professional societies, if you are a member of a professional society or any organization that you think is related to what you plan on doing, mention it. Even if it's not related, then you can mention it. Do you have any teaching experience, preferably in your field of study? Have you been a tutor or a mentor? Have you been involved in any type of research? Okay. On page three, it also includes some of your, your work experience as well as your language skills. Okay. Your list name of your employer. Also talk about your language skills, your test scores. You can leave that blank for now. It is not a prerequisite that you do the GRE and the TOEFL test, which are two compulsory tests for all Fulbright applications or applicants. I beg your pardon. That is a test that will be uh, that will be done once you have been nominated as a shortlist or as a semi-finalist onto the Fulbright program. And we'll talk more about the selection process later on. So don't worry about the test. You can leave that open for now. If you have registered and you'd like to go ahead and do it, then by all means, certainly add that with your application. Okay. Okay, so just to go over um, some of the um, handouts that are found on our website, we've also got something called the Foreign Student Program, Frequently Asked Questions. So if you don't get all of today, you miss part of the webinar today, then what you can do is go to the questions and it has direct answers. Again, if you get stuck, just drop us an email at our email address that we'll give it to you at the end of the show and, um, and you can ask us any questions. You've got to upload your Word documents. You also got to talk about the relevance of your proposal to the faculty and research areas. And, and what we do have here is if you are close to any of our education advising centers and they're based at the US consulates or at some of our American corners, again, you'll find all that info on our website. Try and get hold of the graduate admissions essays. It's a great guide. Do not plagiarize and copy an essay word for word, but use it as a guide to formulate your essay. Remember, the American colleges don't want an American student to apply. A lot of those essays will have been written by American students, as well as some foreign students. You need to be original. They want to see your original. They love South Africans. They love South African students in their classes because you bring a diversity coming from such a diverse country. So try to be as original as possible, but follow the formats of the essays in these guides. And here's another website, fulbright.org.uk, for some great tips on writing a personal statement. Some of the other info that is needed, knowledge of the program and the faculty and your research, thorough and up-to-date knowledge of the field of study, your field of study. So you've got to be an expert, whether you're a master's or PhD student. You've got to highlight your research experience, if you do have any, and also to provide some evidence of depth and breadth of the undergraduate or the master's program. And all of this is part of your research proposal. A personal statement, however, is like a personal interview. So you will be fortunate if you are nominated into the next round 
the shortlist interview round, you will be called to an interview. You will get a 25 minute platform to present yourself to a panel of about five um, interviewees. However, before you get to that stage, you will need to write a personal statement. And that is based, that is one of the criteria that will determine whether you make it to the next round, to the interview round. So use this as an opportunity to talk about what it is you want to do, who you are, where you come from. Don't be boring, don't put it in facts, but put it into a story. Everybody loves a story, young or old. So you're going to make it into a story that'll be interesting, talk about your life, and what brought you to this point, okay? Use vivid details, avoid generic adjectives, use a hook that is, I received a Bachelor of Arts degree 20 years later than my high school peers. It's like writing an essay in school. Remember your teachers would always say to you, start it with something that is outstanding, that'll make me want to read further. The exact same applies to this personal statement. Describe the event in question or report your emotions and thoughts in basic detail, but remember that you have one page in order to put down everything you need us to know. It has to be complete. Personal statement continue. These are some of the pointers to consider. Show your maturity, initiative, resilience, ability to work independently. Those are all characteristics, teamwork, originality of ideas, focus, motivation, assertiveness, commitment, goal orientation, adaptability, self-discipline, and work habits. A lot of these pointers are characteristics that we look for in an application. Very, very important. Personal statement continued. At your conclusion, you should explain why you should be accepted. You will also get an opportunity to do a five-minute presentation on why you should accept it when you are invited to a, an, a personal interview. So very good practice. State why you're interested in studying in the subject of interest. Reinforce the points you made in your main body. End on a positive note with one to two attention grabbing sentences. And don't introduce new ideas at the end and leave us hanging. Nobody likes to be left to see episode two. Okay, number six, um, on page six, upload your CV. If you don't have one, now's a good time to put one together. Upload all your certified university transcripts. Very, very important. You have to have a copy of your grade. So assuming you're applying for masters, you would have completed a four-year undergraduate degree. That is either a bachelor's three years plus your honors year. What you also need to include is the certificate you received at graduation. It does not have to be certified at this point, but you have to have the transcripts and the certificate as well as a copy of the explanation at the back of your transcripts. It'll explain how your university graded you, what system they used. Remember, you are sending this to a US university who may not have heard of your institution. Unlikely, but chances are they may not have heard. So there's got to be a complete explanation. Once again, I'm going to reinforce. If your applications are incomplete or do not have these uh, or incorrect, then they will not be considered. So make sure you have your transcript, the certificate, as well as the explanation sheet for every degree. So if you have your bachelor's, you put all three. If you have your honors, you make sure you have the transcript, the certificate, and the explanation. Doesn't matter if it's from the same institution. If you have a PhD and it's from a different institution, you make sure you have the same info. Page eight, it recalls a calls for all your personal info, your mailing address, your ID, your marital status, dependents, disabilities, other scholarships. Okay, very important. References to waive or not to waive right to inspect contents. Click on the recommendation button on the home page to register your recommenders. We touched on this before. And follow up on your references. Even though you've registered them and you've sent it off, go and make sure that they received it. If it's a professor, for example, who taught you three years ago and he may have forgotten some of the good you achieved in his class or post his class, there's no harm in maybe jotting some pointers and say, Professor Jones, uh, just in case you can't remember, these are some of my achievements and honors awards that I achieved and this is some of the things that I 
I embarked on after we stopped working together. It's a guide for him and he can either remember them and add them or he may decide he has his own content. But you want him to say, you want him to, to represent you, the full, your, all your achievements uh, and, and awards. Um, follow up with the professor, make sure that they received it and then maybe knowing that the deadline is next week, Maybe just send them a friendly email or a friendly call and say, hey, Professor Jones, I trust you well. I'm just following up to see if you had a chance to submit my application, my recommendation. Very important. It's your responsibility to do that, not ours. If the deadline comes and we do not have all the references, then your application will be considered to be incomplete. Okay, so a master's basically takes you from one year to two years on average and four to seven years for a PhD. A non-degree visiting research program is for South Africans who are registered to do a PhD at a South African university and now want to go over to the US and do some sort of collaborative research in the field that they are registered in. It is highly recommended if you consider, if you are considering applying for the visiting researcher student program that you at least have done two years of your PhD degree at the South African University before going over to do your research. Research will be at a post-grad le level in the US, so you've got to make sure that you are comfortable with that level of research. Your, as mentioned earlier, your arrival date will be August 2018 and um, Okay, these are just other details that we need in the application and these are not necessary. Okay, personal information, you've got to be accurate and honest. Notify the Fulbright office if your financial situation has changed, that is if you got awarded another scholarship, it can be used to complement your application or supplement your fees. Include any other scholarships and bursaries and funding um, that you get, let us know so that it, your scholarship can be adjusted accordingly. So we talked about dependents. Note that the Fulbright does not cover expenses for dependents. In fact, the Fulbright program does not encourage master's students to bring families along because it's a very intensive course, it's a full-time course, uh, it, it's very demanding and uh, oftentimes dependents will need supervision depending on how young your children are um, and there's no funding. Medical cover is a very important part of surviving in the US. You as a student will get medical cover from the Institute of International Education or your university but there is no medical cover for your dependents. So these are all factors that you need to take into consideration. You need to have your own funds in order to bring your dependents over to the US. Okay, so university preferences is something that is required of all students, which means you have to go and research. If you're in psychology, it is your duty to go and have a look at all the institutions that offer a master's or PhD in psychology. What you do is make sure that you make contact with the university initially and start up a relationship or discussion with the professor before you put down the institution as a possible fit. You need to make sure that the professor is embarking or the program is the same as what you do in South Africa. Once you make contact, that is great. What you do is you list your university and that's where you leave it. You do not have any further contact with the institution. And you do that for all three or four of your university options. What happens is on the Fulbright program, the Institute of International Education or IIE will continue the collaboration between your university choices on your, and the university on your behalf. You do not make contact with the university and you do not negotiate settlements or placements with the university. That is something that the IIE will do. You have just given them an indication of where you would like to be. Okay, if there's any other institution you may or organization you may be interested, you put it down there. 
And again, these are some of the, the details that you will upload, your writing sample. If you're a PhD candidate in the sciences, physics, for example, you may have to submit submit a writing sample. And this can be anything that you submitted in the past, and it can range anything between 5 and 10 to maximum 20 pages. But you will be notified. It depends on the university you are applying to and the program component that you are applying to. Test scores. These need to be uploaded after you have completed them. And that we will explain later. Don't worry about that. When you register, you nominate the IIE to receive a copy of your report so that they can add that to your application packet. Test course, if you have done the TOEFL, it is valid for five years and the GRE will be valid for two years. If you don't have them, leave this blank. OK, additional pages required. Upload your interview location page, very important. You may be studying in Cape Town, but at the time of interviews, you may be back, will have graduated and be back in Pretoria, and you wish to interview in Pretoria should you be nominated to the shortlist interview round. Make sure you upload th that page and indicate the area that you prefer to be interviewed in. What is not required is the signature form at this stage, Report on proficiency in English, that is something that will come later, that is the test of English as a foreign language. Transcript release forms and academic record, as I said earlier, we do not need certified copies. Once you are nominated as a finalist on the program, these will be required from your institution. Students will be notified. And these are just some of the personal qualities that will elevate an application. So you've gone through the application, you've filled out all the hard stuff academics, test scores, your writing statement, and so on. These are some of the characteristics we look for in that personal statement, as well as what we need to come through in the interview. We look for someone who's a self-starter and who has a very good work ethic. Studying in the US is all self-initiated, self-guided. Your professor will not stand behind you and say, Jane, you have not submitted your writing piece. The deadline is on such and such a day. Jane, the deadline is come and gone. You have not submitted, submitted your writing piece. That is not the kind of attitude of professors in the US. So we don't, we look for someone who, as we said, is self-guided and self-directed and will be able to do these things and think and work independently in any environment, but especially in the US somebody who thinks out of the box and is open to new experiences. So if you have not traveled, for example, if you come from Toyando and you have not traveled out of Toyando, the furthest you've traveled would be Pretoria, then, but you are open to new experiences and the reason you have not traveled is lack of funds, you were busy studying, whatever your reason, but you have to be open. We are looking for someone who's willing to try and venture to broaden their horizons. Someone who's going to be a cultural voice for their community and the global community at large. Somebody who's going to come back and plow back into the country. If that person is you, then please make sure you submit your application by April 17th. So what is the selection process and timeline in a nutshell? This is what it looks like. May 2017, we shortlist candidates and we invite you to an interview in one of these cities, Victoria, Johannesburg, Durban or Cape Town. Once you are nominated, a, a semi-final cohort will be nominated to attend a Fulbright workshop and test preparation, preparation class the day after the interviews. It's compulsory. So what you've got to be in mind, if you are called for an interview, you've got to be available on the day of the interview and the day after the interview to attend a workshop. That is compulsory. It's not negotiable. If you cannot make it, then unfortunately you lose your place on the selection pro in the selection process. In July, students will be registered to write the GRE and you'll get a free voucher from the program to do this. You'll get study material, you get assistance, guidance, and you get six weeks to prepare. Now that's to prepare a new curriculum that is not familiar to South Africans, but that is pretty easy and based on your academic work at your level. It's based on math and, um, and English verbal skills, so it's pretty, pretty familiar to all, but the format of the test is something that you have six weeks to prepare on. 
At the end of July, when the final test scores are in, the final nominations will be made and 50% of the students nominated to the semi-final round will be dropped from the program, based largely on GRE and TOEFL scores attained. At the end of September, beginning October, final names will be submitted to the US, ranked as a principal or an alternate candidate. And between October the 1st and March 2018 is when the application process and the placement process continues in the US. And that is the, the, probably the most stressful period for a lot of students because you have to wait to hear what the placements are. Once you are told at the end of March, once students are notified what their position is, um, the Fulbright office will organize a pre-departure program, book your ticket, get, help you get your visa, tell you how to cross the road in the US, how to navigate the airports, and where to buy your, uh, your data, and so on and so on. And then we say, put you on the plane and send you off to the US for two years, sometimes five years, okay? That is the timeline, and the timeline from the time you apply, which is now till the time you depart, is approximately 14 months. So the application, the processing, and the placement stage, and the pre-departure stage can take anything up to 14 months. Students need to make sure that they are either engaged in studies or work activities during that period, and not sit back and wait for a final notification. A backup plan is always a good idea. How many students are nominated each year? Approximately 20 candidates are selected for the Fulbright program each year, and that is throughout South Africa. Postgraduate students can choose to apply if you do not get or not successful on the program. You can choose to apply directly to graduate programs in the US through our Education USA Advising Centers. Click on the link, educationusa.state.gov and follow the link of the center closest to you. We have counselors and advisors who will give you free information on the different institutions. You have access to resource books and possibly funding sources that you can access on your own. And this is a good consideration for all applicants who don't make it onto the Fulbright program. So what does the Fulbright Pro Scholarship cover? In a nutshell, this is what it covers. It's funding for two years of consecutive study towards a master's or PhD or a doctoral degree. What happens after the doctoral degree is that the student will have made contact with the, with the university that they're studying at and applied to get what is called, oftentimes called a teaching tuitionship, which is an opportunity for you as a graduate student going into your third year PhD to teach a class or assist a professor or do some research depending on your field of study and it's an opportunity that you get paid for and the funding covers your tuition fees largely. We are very fortunate in South Africa to have partnered with the National Research Foundation who sponsors our doctoral students for the full four years of study in the US for their living expenses. So the first two years will be covered, your, your tuition fees will be covered by the Institute of International Education or the US government. And for year three to four or five, depending on how long your, your PhD degree is, um, NRF will continue to fund your living expenses. The Fulbright Scholarship also covers full tuition, as we said, room and board for the first two years, whether you are a master's or PhD candidate. It provides free medical cover for every student, very important. It also covers a round trip ticket to the United States. So um, no coming back in between if you want to, well, then you've got to save your money and come back. Or hopefully you have fairly wealthy parents or a donor back home who will sponsor you a ticket to come back. What often happens is that South African students make friends with students from other states or other countries and end up spending either their Christmases and uh, special holidays at international houses in the US or they end up going home with an American to their farm and shovel hay and feed the pigs. So choice is yours. It also covers visa fees, which is quite an expensive fee. 
um, and it makes sure that should you come back you need and you need to renew your visa then that fee will also be covered by the Fulbright by the US government it provides a little stipend for the student each month to cover some of your basic expenses like your toiletries and so on it's not enough money to buy a Gucci bag but then you're a student and you won't be needing that just yet it also covers your test fees for the GRE and the TOEFL test which if you go online and check it out is quite expensive oftentimes students write the GRE exam more than once as well as the TOEFL if you have any questions, we'd recommend you contact one of these offices. You can contact the Fulbright office, the coordinating office in Pretoria for general inquiries, that is myself, at Fulbright underscore program underscore safrica at state.gov. Or if you're in Cape Town, contact the Fulbright pro program specialist at williamskm at state.gov. If you're in Durban, contact our Durban Fulbright Program Specialist, who is also happens to be the Education USA Advisor, Susan Knowles, at knowlessd at state.gov. Or if you are in Johannesburg, reach out to our Fulbright Program Specialist, Matsaba Motiani, at motianim at state.gov. I thank you for joining us today. I hope you found it useful. I certainly enjoyed chatting to you. And if you have any questions, now's a great time to submit them and send us the questions.